Hello, happy Tuesday. Welcome back to another episode of The Practice. This show is a look into my digital art workflow. I'm Stuart. I'm a 3D artist, illustrator, designer, and your pal. And I'm excited, just like every week, to have you back for another episode. This week, as you can see, we are getting back into a little bit of hard surface modeling. And we are working on modeling this uh, really cool little synth called a Teenage Engineering OP-1. Now, I don't use these things. I'm really not much of a musician at all. To be honest, I have a bit of a tin here. But I enjoy watching other people's creative process on YouTube, and I enjoy watching musicians and creators on YouTube. And there's really a, a ton of super interesting channels that create music and sort of jam and riff on uh, different synths. And I notice a lot of them use this OP-1, which seems to be a, a super pow powerful little setup. I can tell you one thing, even though I'm not much of a musician, I can tell you it's, it's really beautifully designed. It's a, it's a really interesting and really cleanly and, and neatly designed um, little piece of electronics. So that's always really caught my eye about these things. So as it relates to the, to the process here, what I'm doing uh, is a little bit atypical for my creative process, but it makes sense for this type of an object and that I'm starting with Illustrator first. Um, so I'm really just, I'm blocking out the overall shape of the piece and the layout of the buttons. Um, Illustrator, you know, in two dimensions for laying out tons of squares and aligning things and doing a little bit of rounding on the corners and really this sort of simple 2D layout, I think is, is much, much easier in Illustrator, at least for me. Um, because I got, I got my start in design in, you know, the 2D format really in a lot of that being in, uh, in Adobe Illustrator. So what I do really is I just, I draw out the basic layout of the buttons and the object itself in two dimensions. And then I just pop over into cinema and start extruding those things, which you can see I'm doing now, adding a little bit of rounding to the edges, uh, starting with just all the buttons in one group and the overall base object in another group and just start starting really with two extrusions. Um, but then I start stripping out different buttons that are treated differently, um, that, that, that look different. So, you know, this, this thing that I'm working on now is obviously the little screen. So that's going to have different rounding and a different appearance than the rest of the buttons. So I, I strip that out. Notice also that the buttons don't sit on top of the surface of the, of the synth. They are embedded into the surface, and, and the top face of the button seems to be pretty flush with the top face of the case itself. So what I'm doing is adding a little boolean here so that we can drop the keys down to be flush with the surface. Adjusting the rounding here so it works and looks right. Creating one object so we've got a nice smooth fade from one to the other, from one face to the other. As you can see, we've already got the basic shape and proportions of the thing laid out. And I think that's part of the benefit of starting with Illustrator. So adding just a little bit of materiality so I can sort of see the buttons for myself. Um, you tell I've got a different, on that little screen area, I've got no rounding on the, on the extrusion, which is really how that thing looks. And, and now I'm going to start getting into some of the knobs, the most prominent of which are these colorful ones across the top, these, these big knobs. I will say that, you know, I, I'm not going to do every little bit of detail in these pieces. Uh, you know, I reached a point where the thing really was looking like an OP one, um, but I didn't want to get into creating a map for each and every little button type because aside from the large buttons that I wind up modeling, the uh, the smaller buttons is just, it would have been like, you know, 30 or 40 maps to figure out and put in there. And I didn't want to redraw them myself. I, I really wanted to, um, you know, just, just model them, uh, just, just map them flatly onto the face of these things. And I would have had to have taken someone else's photo of the OP one and, and, uh, you know, modified it in a way. And, and then we're, we're sort of 
ordering on copyright infringement there. So I decided to leave some of them be. In any case, we can see for these knobs, what I'm doing is really creating, a, a, you know, starting with a simple cylinder shape, um, creating an additional cylinder that extrudes from that base cylinder, and then using the bevel tool with its um, subdivision settings turned up so that we get these nice smooth uh, transitions from one face to another. I wind up adjusting those a little bit on these, what I'm calling black keys, uh, because the, the bottom right portion of the synth is like a little keyboard. And these little knobs are like the, the black keys on a keyboard. And so I'm just using a soft selection to modify the original knob. I really started with the base shape for both of these, both the upper knobs and the bottom knobs, and just just adjusted them ever so slightly. You can see I haven't done it yet with the top knobs, but along the bottom, what I did was just use a simple instance to create duplicates of those. And as it gets more complicated and I start bullying out the top of this little knob, I thought it made sense to use instances for those as well. See, I changed my mind there. Instead of copying and pasting them, I just used instances, which is a much faster way to do things. Drop in another simple cylinder. There's that button. It's that knob, I should say. And for these knobs, what I'm doing really is starting with the base shape of the extrude the, the, the spline that we're extruding to make the key itself. Partly that's because I've already got it in position, partly because the proportions are kind of right for what we need here. And so I just make this big rounded button. But what I know I'm going to need to do is expand that. So I make some subdivisions along the edges. And again, I want to make that nice smooth transition from the face of the button to the protruding knobby area there. Although these aren't true knobs, but they have that sort of raised surface, right? I know a lot of artists would probably extrude this directly from the face of the base key itself, but I decided to keep them as two separate segments and have the transition of the top section be smooth enough that I can place it uh, you know, near enough to where it needed to be, and in the rendering, the transition would appear seamless enough. And I, I think I, I got away with that. And so I think what I wind up do, doing here is, is uh, instead of using instances, I think I wind up just throwing this guy in a cloner, because there's so many of them, and they're so similar. They're not similar. They're exactly alike. I should be more precise with my language. So that we've cloned those across, but really we've got a lot of progress made here. And now we're going to get into a bit of bullying that kind of slows down the model. I wind up turning it off for a while as I finish this up. But uh, I'm going to take a whole bunch of these little cylinders here and create the perforations in the top left corner that are the speaker. I'm just using a grid array cylinder in a cloner. And that really is the basics of it. So then I expand it and delete from the edges to mimic that shape. I didn't go through and why, you know, I didn't count each and every little perforation. So I, I can't tell you if this is exactly accurate, but it's pretty darn close. See that little beach ball showing up there? It's a, a bit of a heavy processing, but a bit of heavy processing for the old laptop here to bully out all of these. And since it was so heavy, and since I felt that the holes were a little small, what I did was I actually went around and removed the outermost edge and just gave my processor fewer perforations to deal with, which helped a little bit. 
um, and I think it will help in the final rendering since uh, since the holes were large enough to render nicely and, and appear proportionate. So good enough. So now along the right edge, I'm adding a few bits of details here. Got these little, I think they're little monitor lights of some sort. Adding those in, just as simple cylinders, and then the little logo in Helvetica, I believe. That's what I use at least. Now the one thing, the, the other thing I did skip in this process is the edges. It looks like there's some little USB ports and, and you know, power outlet ports um, on the sides of these things, and I don't wind up getting into all that. Again, this is a pretty accurate but not entirely accurate recreation of these guys so um, so there you have it these are meant to be exercises you know if, if, if teenage engineering themselves approached me and said hey we need an absolutely dead-on accurate view of your uh, of, of this synth here then that would have been a different story but for these weekly practice episodes they don't always have to be 100% polished and finished masterpieces. These are really about learning and building out a library of assets and, you know, improving your skills. So, there we have it. Now what I decided to do is, since I want that little screen to have a, an illuminated graphic on it, I found a, an image of, a high enough resolution image of the piece itself, and I could, you know, copy and paste out that little screen graphic. We'll just go ahead and add that to the materials here. That's a fairly simple thing to map in since it's just a flat surface. So I just do a, like a cubic projection. Just sort of position that there so it looks right. It was actually angled a little odd, so Going back in to adjust those things. A lot of times it's easier to just go back into Photoshop, make the adjustment, and then reload the map into Cinema, which is what I did there. <clears throat> Here's that little logo we talked about. A lot of people, I think, would, would choose to create a, a flat graphic out of that and map it in, but in the interest of time, I decided to just use a Motex object. And now, since we're getting pretty close, I decided it'd be a good idea to start adding a little bit of light, some shadowing, you can see if those buttons are looking right, if the transitions between the, the knobs and the buttons are looking right. And... Now I'm going to go through and start making a bit of a complicated selection because I do want to, even though I'm not going to map every little button graphic in, I do want to create those little 3D uh, extrusions on each of the buttons. And I decided instead of, instead of creating one of them and copying them across each, each individual button, I would do a similar thing that I did to the to the keys along the bottom right side in that I would just start with the base extrusion shapes. I'd make a copy of those splines that we extrude from and modify those in a way that it would create what I needed in terms of a knob or a little, you know, a little extrusion. And I'm trying a few things here, and not all of them are working. I'm trying to do it without uh, going through and deleting additional points. But it turns out what, what I think I needed to do, and what I wind up doing here, is I'm not able to make it work with just, um, you know, the create outline command, which is what I was hoping to do. It was uh, giving me this sort of weird four-leaf clover shape. And after trying a whole bunch of these commands to see if I could do it in a procedural way, I decided my best bet would be to add an additional point so that I could make these uh, true squares, not squares with uh, two shapes per corner, two, two points per corner, rather. So now I'm going through and deleting additional points from the sort of the chamfered edges of each of these. 
so that each button, each square here, would only have four points instead of, what was it, eight. And then what I'm able to do is create an outline from there and then round that. So then now each of those buttons has a little extrusion that's placed dead center and right where I need it. And then I'm able to throw those into a, uh, an, you know, another extrude nerve, and that gives us the depth. But then we can use a concave fillet edge, which gives us that really nice transition and creates the button sort of all at once. And now I've got all of the little extrusions for those buttons placed exactly where I needed, was able to do it sort of all in one felt swoop. Took a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of trial and error, a little bit of guesswork, but I was able to get it to work pretty well. And sometimes it makes sense to just see if you can grab all of those similar objects and do that all in one shot. And so again, that was, you know, selecting all the objects, uh, modifying their stroke in a way that there was only four points, and then using the create outline command, which makes it sort of smaller, but keeps the proportions the same. And then I was able to chamfer those edges into basically a perfect circle, which is what we have here. And now I'm leaning into one of my favorite features of Cinema 4D lately, which is the wood surface. So if you're creating a texture and you go down to surfaces and wood, it's like all the way at the bottom, you realize that there's this procedural material uh, in cinema that comes up with really realistic wood. Um, there's a bunch of options in there. You can make it curlier or gnarlier or really alter the look of the wood. But for a simple wood table, which I think acts as a great backdrop for this OP1, um, this wood material works really well. I'm making a copy of it to add to the bump channel so that we have a little bit more of a realistic interaction with the lighting. And we're pretty darn close. Here's another example of um, treating four similar objects the same way all at once. I just went ahead and pressed a uh, option and added a, a cylinder to each of those knobs, which if you hold option, it, it copies them into the same place as the parent object. And then I just threw those into a bool. I sized them all down together and threw them into a bool all at the same time. And we had four exactly similar um, Boolean shapes around those knobs, which gives us that little circular reveal. The last thing I decided is that the screen didn't look quite realistic because the graphics were right at the outer edge. And what, what actually is going on, as we can see in that one reference image that I'm using, is that the screen has a bit of glass and the, at, the, at the top surface, and then the graphics of the screen itself are positioned down and behind the glass a little bit. So what I'm doing here is, you know, copying that extrusion and making the bottom layer the graphic and the top layer the glass. So there you have it. And you notice throughout this process, because it's I'm, I'm looking to recreate a specific existing item, I'm using lots and lots of reference imagery, which is really, really helpful. And, you know, for an object like this, you can really, you can use Google Images as a way to look at every angle and really get a, an accurate look into what it is you're trying to create. So now I've got the final rendering. I'm pretty happy with it. Fairly simple light setup with just a spot and, um, uh, you know, a fill light as a sky object and just doing a, a bit of last minute retouching in Photoshop to arrive at this finished image. So if you, if you like this video, please hit thumbs up. Subscribe, and if you have further questions, leave a comment below. If you want to keep up with me and the work I'm doing, hit me up at DLGNCE at Instagram. And don't hesitate to reach out and say hello. This is Stuart saying goodbye. See you next week. Thanks.